Our topic for this session is gastroesophageal emergencies. Our first case is of candidal esophagitis. There is extensive wall thickening throughout the length of the esophagus, and note as well the enhancement of the mucosa consistent with inflammation. You can really appreciate the extent of that wall thickening, which is present throughout the entirety of the esophagus. And it is that extent that should at least make you consider the possibility of candidal esophagitis as opposed to reflux esophagitis or the more common forms. So that's a case of candidal esophagitis. Our next case is emphysematous gastritis and esophagitis. You see the esophagitis here, a ring of intramural gas in the mid-esophagus that really is present throughout its length. In the abdomen, there is extensive gastric pneumatosis and, in addition, peripheral arborizing linear gas collections in the liver consistent with portal venous gas. Here you see the extent of the esophageal pneumatosis, fairly unusual finding, extending down to involve the stomach as well. And here in the peripheral liver, arborizing gas collections consistent with portal venous gas. This, of course, can represent extensive ischemic or infectious uh, pneumatosis. And in this particular case, the suspicion was ischemic. Uh, this patient did not, however, survive, and that was not definitively determined. Our next case is a case of cirrhosis with active esophageal hemorrhage. There are foci of submucosal contrast uh, denoting active extravasation, possibly below the level of the mucosa here in the upper esophagus and in the mid portion as well. In the abdomen, you can appreciate the abnormal liver contour consistent with cirrhosis and you can see enlargement and recanalization of the umbilical vein. So let's first look at those foci of submucosal contrast there and there, very large one distally. Now let's look at the abnormal liver contour. That region immediately adjacent to the falciform ligament can be very helpful as it's one of the first areas to show the nodularity of cirrhosis, but in this case, you're better able to appreciate that recanalized and enlarged umbilical vein. The more astute of you may have already picked up on this parenchymal nodule here in the periphery, which in the setting of cirrhosis is obviously concerning for a primary hepatic neoplasm. So that's a case of cirrhosis with active esophageal hemorrhage. Our next case is an esophageal rupture. There is extensive mediastinal gas. And here on the posterior aspect of the esophagus, you can see free contrast that has leaked from the distal esophagus. This is the classic appearance of a Mallory Weiss tear leading to a Borhov syndrome. It is worth noting that in these patients, the esophageal lacerations related to retching and vomiting, they will tend to have fairly extensive mediastinal gas, as you see in this case. In the traumatic esophageal ruptures, the mediastinal soft tissues tend to knit together tightly and prevent the extensive pneumomediastinum that you see here. And there is a lung window for better appreciation of that pneumomediastinum. So let's follow the esophagus first, noting all that gas surrounding it and outlying its outer aspect very nicely. Now let's appreciate that contrast. There it is on the posterior aspect of the esophagus and the extensive pneumomediastinum as seen on lung windows. 
So that is a case of acute esophageal rupture or Borhov syndrome, again associated with extensive pneumomediastinum and extravasation of contrast. Our next case is of alcoholic gastritis. You can obviously appreciate significant fatty infiltration of the liver and marked hypodense wall thickening throughout the stomach, also with mucosal enhancement suggestive of inflammation. Let's first appreciate the fatty infiltration of the liver, which will give you the hint that this is most likely going to be alcoholic gastritis. Now let's appreciate that marked gastric wall thickening. Look at how hypodense and edematous it is, and the contrast then that is provided with that enhancing mucosa. It's the clinical history that carries the day here. This patient had imbibed seven shots of Jack Daniels whiskey in the course of an hour. So the diagnosis was not particularly elusive. So that is alcoholic gastritis. Our next case is a perforated posterior gastric ulcer. This is a set of findings very worth knowing. There is intraperitoneal gas and intraperitoneal fluid easy enough so far. But on a lower cut, you can see foci of intraperitoneal gas and fluid, but in addition, small regions of lesser sac gas. That is characteristic of a posterior gastric perforation and in fact is highly specific. In the setting of gastric perforation, it's quite frequent that you will see small bowel wall thickening and stranding, most likely the response of the small bowel to being bathed in gastric contents. Let's first appreciate that intraperitoneal gas, where it is anteriorly, and next in the lesser sac and portal region, you can see foci of gas that are not in communication with the remainder of the peritoneal cavity. So that is a perforated posterior gastric ulcer with gas in the lesser sac. Our next case is a gastric volvulus. This is a tough one, but that is the duodenum, the first and second portions of the duodenum dragged out of place by the displaced gastric antrum, which is flipped upwards and posterior to its normal and leftward, I guess, uh, compared to its normal position. Note the marked distension of the stomach, suggesting there is a serious element of outflow obstruction. In addition, follow the nasogastric tube, especially on the movie version, which will really help you identify the location of the gastroesophageal junction. On a lower cut, you can again appreciate the dilation of the stomach and the medial displacement of the spleen, which is often seen accompanying gastric volvulus due to the drag of the leonogastric ligament. First appreciate that displaced duodenum do you appreciate that that's coming up from its normal position in the third portion? And the first and second portions are right here, elongated and displaced. Next, appreciate that spleen, which is medially displaced, proving beyond doubt that the stomach is twisted. Also appreciate that nasogastric tube coming in through the gastroesophageal junction. On the coronals, you can also appreciate that elongated and displaced duodenum coming here into the region of the gastric antrum. And here, the displaced spleen. So that is a case of gastric volvulus with an associated wandering spleen.
Our last case is of a superior mesenteric artery syndrome with extensive ischemia. There is probably more portal venous gas here than I believe I've ever seen, outlining essentially the entirety of the portal venous system throughout the liver. In addition, on the posterior aspect of the stomach, you can see small foci of gas within the wall of the stomach itself, clearly not obeying the laws of gravity and density, and thus clearly intramural. Extensive pneumatosis outlines all of the stomach and the duodenum here, and you can see the duodenal obstruction with it pinching to a point quite typical of superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Note as well the cachectic nature of the entire patient's body uh, consistent with that diagnosis as well. So let's note right here where you'll see the duodenum pinched together. There is the location of its obstruction. Obviously there is extensive gastric distension and that pneumatosis extends even into the distal esophagus. So that is a case of superior mesenteric artery syndrome with extensive ischemia and obviously obstruction. Incredibly enough, this patient did survive. And that concludes this session on gastroesophageal emergencies.